So what you hunting? Jesus freaks. I didn't know that was season, man. Yeah, well. Just tell me, man. They lit her on fire! They were weirdo hippie types. Whole bunch of them. Then there, there was a muscle. It didn't make any sense. They were bikers and gnarly psychos and crazy evil. Black skulls. Black skulls. Look at me. For a while now, word's been coming down from the big rig, something dark and fearsome out there. No one knows where they come from. First, it was stories from the interstate, leaving truckers for dead, prostitutes vanishing, and gutted bodies on doorsteps, and always the same. Biker gang, black bikes, only seen at night. Weird shit. Sundown, dazzling day, go. This is Greg Sestero, and you are listening to My Movies Better. This week, spoilers ahead. So if you have not seen the film Mandy, don't listen to this unless you don't care about spoilers. So I'm about an hour through the 2018 surreal horror film Mandy, and while the title character herself is a bit tied up at the moment and being burned alive at the behest of Charles Manson wannabe and all-around shitty musician Jeremiah Seed, I mean uh, Sand, I'm struck by an interesting thought. Never in a film, except perhaps in Takeshi Miike or maybe a field in England, have I been so motherfucking uncomfortable. It's not even really the subject matter, dark as it is, or the lighting, red and dark as it is, or the fact that after one hour Nicolas Cage has freaked out a total number of zero times. It's something else entirely, a lingering sense of dread that seems to stretch with each elongated camera shot, like the lighting and the sound design of the film all meant to slow down each moment nearly to the point of slow motion. And by the time that the eponymous heroine is dying at the hands of the totally not related to Far Cry Children of the New Dawn, the shots have actually become slow motion. The sound of the world disappearing within the swelling score. We drift over each character's expression as they watch the immolation. And hot damn, somebody made a god dang revenge movie where the catalyst of the revenge doesn't happen in the first act of the film. This week, I finally got around to rewatching Mandy, the 2018 Panos Cosmatos film starring Nicolas Cage, Andrea Risebro, Linus Roach, and Bill Duke. The film centers around Red, Cage, and his wife Mandy, Riseboro, who are attacked by a group of nightmarish, sadomasochistic LSD bikers at the request of Jeremiah Sand, Roach, a failed musician and cult leader. The first half of the film shows us this act, which takes place over the course of one hour, where Mandy and Red are subdued, Mandy is drugged, and Sand tries to indoctrinate her with his shitty hippie bullshit music that he says is better than the Carpenters, but isn't, and the Carpenters suck. No offense, Karen Carpenter. When Mandy laughs in the face of his terrible, stupid music and his rather average penis, he loses it. She is burned alive in front of Red, and thus Red vows his revenge. Well, it's a little strange that the Children of the New Dawn didn't just kill him too. That's okay, because my god does the second hour of this film have some shit in store for you.
While the first half of the film belongs mainly to Mandy and Jeremiah, it is the second half that belongs to the star of the film, Mr. Nick Coppola himself, Nicolas Cage. After all, this is a revenge story, and he is the Revenger. So while this lame-ass shitty musician cult guy thinks they got away with the murder, we know much better. We knew they are fucked, because if there's one thing you don't do, you don't fuck with Nicolas Cage, unless you're in The Wicker Man, I guess. What, what is that? What is that? What is it? Oh, no, not the beast! Not the beast! Ah! Oh, my eyes! My eyes! Ah! Ah! These children cry. After painfully escaping from Jesus' crown of thorns, or whatever type entanglement they've given him, and inspecting the charred remains of the title character, we know it's fucking on. But Mandy has a few more surprises in store for us. I would also like to point out that the po this is the point in the movie when the Nicolas Cage acts with props trope comes up as he does a stunning scene acting against some smoldering remains. R.I.P. Mandy. Then he comes home in his underwear. And all I can say is, man, the 1980s were fucked. I would like to get me some Cheddar Goblin. Anyway, did I mention there's animation in this movie? Yeah, it's really interesting. It's almost Frank Frazetta inspired animation, like, and it's sort of like the fantasy landscapes that Mandy draws. Um, but when you first see this animation, that's the film, the point in the film when it suddenly changes. And for the first time, Nicolas Cage freaks the fuck out, and it is so worth it. He literally screams a whole bunch while pouring alcohol on his wounds. It's an all star 11 out of 10 freak out, and I mean that. Other than some of the over-the-top ridiculous acting he's been ridiculed for in the past, such as Vampire's Kiss, this feels really very real. <laughs> but the camera and the lighting and the sound very specifically change up at this point. While the first half of the film does a lot of black and red with hints of blue and purple and white, until eventually those colors seem to melt into only black and red. In the second half, we have this return to clarity, which we saw at the beginning of the picture. Total color takes back control, the encroaching blackness is gone, for now, and left in its place is a sort of yellow haze, a haze of rage and determination. This is also the point when we are introduced to Bill Duke as Carruthers, and Nick Cage's trusty crossbow, the Reaper. Also, Nick Cage freaks out again, and once again, it's perfectly pitched, not too over the top and out of control. You can tell that the director and the cinematographer really knew how to synthesize and refine those skills that Cage has, and getting this really pure, really truthful result. Here we have the formal introduction of the gnarly biker gang from earlier, the Black Skulls. They're probably my favorite part of this film outside of all the LSD. Vicious and almost mythic sadomasochistic bikers who are presented as some sort of barbarian presence driven wild by drugs and murder in the deep of the forest. Of course, this is all chalked up to a bad batch of acid and a little fucked up murder creating a thirst that could not be quenched, even by Gatorade. This scene is really powerful and provides a perfect segue from the first half to the second, and for such a short scene, the chemistry between Duke and Cage is really very good. It sort of reminded me of the opening scene from Blade Runner 2049 in its drawing inability, but being situated in the middle of the film, it provides a great foreshadowing of the stunning and violent climax to come. While the first half of the film was dominated by much more atmospheric and ambient music, all of it preceded by the epic climb of King Crimson's Starless. The second half shifts gears into a more up-tempo electronic bass lines, which drive forward unremittingly, like Cage himself, into the action to come. After this, we get some great shots of Nick Cage smelting a motherfucking axe, I think. It looks like an axe at least, it, but it's like an axe with a blade all the way down the handle. And in order to get true revenge, you definitely need a melee weapon like this that can do maximum damage at all times. I also want to mention that this film is broken up into separate acts, with each of their own title cards. The first was Shadow Mountains, 1983 AD. The second was Children of the New Dawn. And the third and final is Mandy 
which gets a sick black metal band logo for its title, albeit one you can actually read. Well, at first. Anyway, this third act is when the shit, which has already been ramping its way up over the course of the first hour and 15 minutes, hits maximum overdrive, and Nick Cage goes evil LSD-crazed biker hunting, which does not go tremendously well for him, I must say, meaning, yes, you guessed it, shit officially hits the fan. Or should I say before the LSD hits Nick Cage? But before that, he gets beat up so bad that he looks like Paul Giamatti. So he takes out all the bikers, who kind of sound like the Predator, and thank God for his trusty box cutter, he slices the leader biker's throat and takes a literal bath in his b dragon's blood. And then some motherfucker, who ripped his shirt, mind you, shoots the goddamn porn on TV, like God damn it, Terry. He takes that DB out, and he gets his magic axe back and hits the road once more. Oh wait, he also eats some LSD jam or butter or something, and his face immediately melts. Uh, figuratively, of course. And now it's time for some real Nick Cage acting. Oh yeah, it's like zero to five million in about 20 seconds and we are fucking ready for the insane climax. Oh, and we finally get to see that cool ass axe in action too. In a motherfucking knife finger versus magic axe fight. And oh man, is it cool. The lighting, flickering flames, looking at the edges of the screen, all shot at perfect distance. Take notes, Christopher Nolan. It is really superb. Nick Cage lodges an axe in the last biker's fucking cranium, has a smoke, and just breathes it all in, really. What a fucked up week it's been, eh? The next scene here might be my favorite. Uh, it's full of myth and mysticism, and its dialogue features two people completely zonked on LSD and has a tiger in it. Neil Breen influence? I'm gonna just say yes. Nick Cage goes to see the LSD chemist, who, as I said, is completely boned LSD-wise. And the tiger's name is Lizzie. She's sort of his alarm system. Anyway, the chemist seems almost clairvoyant, which is an interesting touch, and the scene plays out with seemingly no rhyme or reason to it at first until it begins to make sense momentarily before descending back into an uncomfortable lack of control. It's really a scene that should, you should watch closely, as unnerving as it is. And it's probably what I like most about it. The fact that maybe the most uncomfortable I've been during this whole film is in its least violent scene. It's how the director places all these symbols around you, the music, the blood, the drugs, the tiger, and creates such an uncomfortable place, only to tell you, oh, it's okay, the tiger isn't worried, so neither should you. But all the dread is still so all-encompassing, you can't escape it. The chemist tells Nick Cage to head north, after surmising that he has been wronged by the children, and away we go to the thrilling climax. Down a mineshaft, into what looks like hell, Nick Cage descends. Here, there is another long back-out shot that I really enjoy, followed by some more animation, which appear to be almost becoming Nick Cage's dreams, because he keeps waking up from the animation. Deep in the wilderness, he comes across the church in the wild and the home of the children, and he gets to kill him. And man, does he kill vengefully. After finishing off one cult member with the business end of his magic axe, he spares the life of one of the women that Jeremiah has captured. And I must say, at this point, the film almost goes into slasher territory, and I love it. Oh yeah, and there's a fucking chainsaw duel. Nick Cage picks up a short chainsaw, and the cult schmuck picks out a fucking long one. And it's on. After an epic clash, fuck man, you know who wins, dude. It's Nicolas Cage. He chops that dude up, and if you haven't seen it, I won't tell you how. But it's brutal, brutal death, I can assure you that. Now, if you don't want me to spoil the ending of this film for you, you should probably shut this off right now and go watch Mandy. I mean it. Really. If not, well... You're still here? Okay, cool. Because it's pretty much what you expect. The ending. Within the temple. As this almost sun style of... sun O for you non-initiated. Style of drony stoner doom blares. I'm fucking sold on this movie completely. It feels just as big and mythological as it tries to be, but it doesn't feel weighty and pretentious at the same time, at least to me. He travels deeper and deeper into this temple, searching for the object of his revenge, deeper and deeper into the dark and red. He is apocalypse personified, and he is here to destroy the children. 
So he chops off an old lady's head, and Jeremiah's in his briefs, and Nick Cage has his magic axe. Pretty cut and dry, right? Jeremiah's about to get his big time, right? I mean, that's what this has all been leading up to. Jeremiah tries to tell Nick Cage that he's God, and Nick Cage can't harm him, and blah, 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 blah. But I guess he forgot about the little magic axe equalizer. It's a very interesting, squirmy, begging for one's life scene. Jeremiah becomes angry. He tries to bargain. He begins to cry. He even says he'll suck Nick Cage's dick, now stuck within the cradle of fear. But Nick Cage is his god now, as he so delightfully points out, so he crushes Jeremiah's skull, and revenge has been served, and he has a smoke. Well, no, he just burns them up, just like Mandy was burned. It's extremely powerful, and while it doesn't really break away from any of the conventions of the coup de grace scenes from revenge movies past, it feels so satisfying after all we and Nick Cage have been through. But what did he have to become in order to be his revenge? In the end, Cage is the monster, and the monsters from earlier have been reduced to begging for their worthless lives. Though he sees the smiling vision of Mandy at the end bringing him back to when they first met, what of that person has been lost in the desire to destroy? The final shots of the film are absolutely haunting. The ingenuine smiles, the hellish fantasy landscape, and the feeling that now Nick Cage has become as unhinged and unrepentant as the bikers. What an astonishing film. It really left a deep impression on me that I cannot shake, and I strongly recommend it, not only to fans of horror and revenge flicks, but for fans of cinema in general. It is definitely a must-see and see again. I would also like to point out that all the music today in this episode is music of Johan Johansson, uh, who is the, was an Icelandic composer, and he did the soundtrack for this film, uh, released posthumously. He died in February of 2018 in Berlin uh, at the age of 48 uh, from an accidental overdose of cocaine combined with his medication. Um, it's very sad. In a lot of ways, we're robbed of a very, very great composer. I love the soundtrack to this movie, which is why I put so much of it in this episode. So you can kind of get a feel, kind of bring you back to the place that you were when you saw the movie. Or if you haven't seen it, get you really into it. It's one of my favorite soundtracks. Uh, I listen to it a lot. So I wanted to give him a big shout out. He has passed, obviously, as I said, but his music really, I think, makes this film uh, what it is and it's very powerful so uh, that about wraps up Mandy uh, my official rating for Mandy would be probably 89% uh, I really enjoyed it I don't think it is uh, some people have really put it on a pedestal and I definitely love the film but I do think and I do think it is a step forward I was not a huge fan of Beyond the Black Rainbow um, his first film Though I thought it was interesting, this film really uh, pushed his style into new directions. So again, if you haven't seen the film, I would highly suggest it. I watched it on Shudder, uh, so you can see it there uh, exclusively, I believe. So if you want to, sign up for a free trial and uh, you can watch it for free and then cancel it. So I'm not paid by Shudder, so I have no reason to... Uh, give them any free advertising so once again thank you for listening to this episode a short bonus review episode of my movies better i'm kevin uh we'll be back soon with episode 30 on 90s movies part two featuring the player chung king express and the fifth element until then good night good luck go fuck yourself and have a great time doing it and we love you bye